things with more than just established scientists because we're not doing it for ourselves or doing it for for the community so it's nice to be trying to be on the platform and sharing the information that i think is valuable so yeah enjoying yeah. it and the conversations are totally different too like when you're having a, a stuffy academic conversation it's like where's this like we're looking at this image where's the scale bar you know but yeah. like you start talking to non-scientists and they're like they point out really cool things and it's just i don't know a lot of time a lot more enjoyable for me so but i agree with that yeah yeah so thank you for being here um just to note to everyone watching if you have questions i promise my dog should stop barking at some point but if you have questions feel free to just throw them in the chat um you, if you're also feeling extremely brave you're welcome to turn on your camera and step on stage to join us here um to chat or ask questions or whatever so without further ado maybe we should just start can you tell me what's what this image is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is an image I took uh, a few years ago uh, when I was doing my predoctoral research, and this is an image inside of a spinal cord. And what you're seeing here, these darkened little shadows, are individual mitochondria. Um, so a lot of us know mitochondria. The, really, the main thing we know is that they're the powerhouse of the cell, uh, but they have a lot of other functions, and that's what I spent a lot of time researching. Um, yeah, in grad school. So this is actually really funny. And I feel like uh, a real jerk for doing this, but I genuinely want to know what's the scale of this question of this picture. Cause I was just talking <laughs> joking about the scale bar, but I'm actually curious. Now. Oh it. man. You know, you know, uh, on the published figure, there is a scale bar. There is a scale <laughs> bar. Mitochondria are very small. Um, I want to say, um, like between one to six microns. So um, like, is everything in this image inside of a single cell? Yeah, so this is within, mm, this is within a cross section of the of the spinal cord. Okay, so, so within, you know, it's really amazing actually, because if you just look at like the percentage of the image that's taken up by mitochondria, it's a pretty good percentage. It looks like it might be, I don't know, 10, 15, 20%? Yeah, they can be quite dense in certain areas, um, especially in neural tissue uh, and especially within axons. So mitochondria will transport themselves and travel as they see fit. Um, so there, there can be some images where you see hardly anything. Um, this particular image is, is very dense mitochondria. Wow. So you mentioned that they're dense in axons. And this is an image from the spinal cord. So mm -hmm. are, it, would this be an image that is relatively high in mitochondrial content because it's the spinal cord? Absolutely. This was actually an image taken from um, tissue that had been treated with a compound that enhances mitochondria. So we expected to see increased, increased density of the mitochondria. And it's nice to see a visual representation. So often in science, we're relying on... Um, you know, non-visual representation. So different different analyses of the RNA or protein structure, but to see the actual organelle itself um, using electron microscopy is, is exciting. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, okay, so this is a perfect segue into the conversation that we're about to have because we've already touched on a lot of sort of the key highlights of what I want to talk about. Um, you study spinal cord injury and which is why when you were taking this image, you were doing some analysis of whether you could elevate the function or density of mitochondria in the spinal cord. So why don't we just start with sort of a broad introduction to the idea of spinal cord injury and maybe just cover like, what does the spinal cord do? It may seem like an obvious question, but it may not be so intuitive for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you're right. I do, I do study spinal cord injury, but the first thing we have to, to know is what does the spinal cord core do and what functions are you losing um, after injury? So generally, I like to describe the spinal cord as this informational highway um, where it transmits sig signals from your brain down to all of your periphery tissues and organs. It also is a sensory highway in which all, all of the senses, you know, your sight, your sight's a little bit, smells a little bit. So a lot of your senses, um, particularly pain, um, pressure, 
they all get transmitted from your periphery up your spinal cord into your brain. So it is an essential uh, neural network. It's an essential informational highway in order to allow your brain to understand what is going on within your body. Uh, it's also really important for your reflexes. Your reflexes are not controlled by your brain. They're actually regulated by your spinal cord. So that um, very common test that your doctor may have done when you're a kid, when they tap the base of your knee, uh, that input does not go to your brain. It goes to your spinal cord to have that um, reflex. So that's kind of like the general role of your spinal cord. It also, and this is really essential, is it can regulate autonomic functions, uh, particularly breathing. And this becomes a really big issue with spinal cord injury. Uh, so there's many different ways in which the spinal cord can be damaged. Uh, most people are familiar with this, the mechanical damage. Um, so blunt force trauma to your back after maybe a fall. Uh, this is particularly relevant for a lot of veterans who experience traumas. Um, as well as after car crashes. And when this happens, the spinal column is crushed, but not only that, your spinal cord is crushed and this will lead to um, loss of a lot of neurological functions. Um, even if your brain is fully intact, if it cannot transmit these signals to the rest of your body, then you've essentially lost the function for your brain to communicate with your body. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about how the spinal cord works. Um, yeah, when it's like general functions are. Yeah, I, I think the really interesting thing about the spinal cord is it's very, it's physical. It's like you have this physical cord that's literally just like taking information from the brain and transmitting it down the spine and then throughout the body through your peripheral nerves. And because the brain, like everything happening up here in this organ is very unclear and like it's not like it's all convoluted but like the spinal cord is just this thing and it's like it needs to be protected so we have this spine that wraps nicely around it actually you have some slides and oh i got rid of it but okay <laughs> no that's okay that is okay um yeah no it, it is it is it's a very the body does a really good job generally of protecting itself in order to prevent injuries like this from happening unfortunately within you know the central nervous system um and with cell types such as neurons that are so vulnerable to injury, when they do experience injury or cell death, it is much harder rec to recover rather than, you know, an injury to a muscle or even your liver or something. Um, the capacity to regenerate is substantially decreased. Um, yeah. And, 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 uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure where I was going with that. I was just going to keep going. Uh, but no, there are, the, and that's why um, there's, I think, so much interest in research within the central nervous system is because treatment uh, avenues um, are so much more limited. You have such a much, you have a much more limited time to address these injuries or issues within the central nervous system, both for traumatic injuries as well as neurodegenerative compared to other injuries. So maybe your liver, um, your stomach, your leg. Yeah. And sort of, again, sort of going back to this idea of them being like physical, it's like when you're maybe some of the people watching have seen in a football game where there's a hard collision and guy falls on his back or on his stomach and it's just limp. And the, when the medical staff come over, it's like, do not move him. Like just leave him exactly how he is. And they rush them to the hospital because, like you were saying, the timeline is so critical. Getting into yeah. quickly. Yeah, it is. And sometimes it's, in, it's good that you bring that up because, you know, your body has created this column and your spinal column as well as your skull to protect itself. But when these bones break, all of a sudden your central nervous tissue is so much more vulnerable. If this if these broken bones puncture your spinal cord, or if they even even pinch, even reduce blood flow to certain areas, it can be so detrimental compared to any other organ. So it is very physical and the injury itself, you're, you're not just worried about the singular event, you're worried about everything that happens after that, how your anatomy has shifted after this, both within you know something we visualize very easily, like how bone can press on the spinal cord, but also the vasculature within it and how damaged vasculature can really, really impair function um, across all different, all different uh, neural injuries. Yeah. And I, 
I remember this, I hope correctly, please tell me if this is true, that damage in the spinal cord is more likely to result in like intense scarring that can have long-term consequences. Yeah, you do have a lot of glial scarring in the spinal cord. Uh, and that has been um, a highly investigated area in, in understanding what happens after this injury. And it's thought, like we said, the brain's transmitting signals down your spinal column. And if you have this scar, this tissue that is blocking transmission, then you're effectively halting the function of your spinal cord. And there are some theories that if you could just remove this scar, then transmission can continue. And unfortunately, it's a, it's a much more complex issue than that. Um, because once the scar is formed, even if you were to physically remove it, function does not immediately uh, restore itself. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what we're going to be talking a lot about is, um, you know, you've studied spinal cord injury, not on the side of how do we induce spinal cord injury, but how do we heal spinal cord injury? So that's what we're going to be talking about. And um, I want to just point out that the nervous system, how it heals in general, like what we were talking about in the spinal cord is going to be similar to how healing, how cells, brain cells heal in the brain. Um, but there are differences. So like we were just discussing this scarring in the spinal cord that makes things different than in the brain. But um, a lot of this conversation is generally going to apply to things like traumatic brain injury or like all neurodegenerative diseases, anything that can affect the health of brain cells. So if you have any related questions, not specifically about spinal cord injury, feel free to throw them out and uh, we can, Dr. Piff can, uh, <laughs> are, are you okay with me calling you Dr. Piff? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with anything. Yeah. Uh, I really like that name. Um, <laughs> yes. Dr. Piff can, can answer whether this, these things apply to, you know, these other conditions that we may talk about. So, we were talking before this about how there are two sort of broad approaches to spinal cord injury. Could you please walk through? Yeah, that? absolutely. So the approach to treat uh, any any traumatic injury in the brain is um, you ha you have two options after this injury has occurred. You can um, take on a neuroprotective approach, or you can take on a neuroregenerative approach. And the neuroprotective approach is um, highly more investigated compared to the neuroregenerative uh, neuroregenerative uh, for several reasons. So neuroprotective, when I say this term, I mean preventing injury from getting worse. Uh, so after, say, spinal cord injury, you're going to have spinal shock. You're going to have a rapidly reduced function. Now, naturally, without any treatment, there will be gradual recovery. However, kind of what I was alluding to earlier, you know, your spinal cord is being pinched in some way, or the, this injury is progressing. The blood vessels or vasculature are no longer getting to this injured area. And if this continues, then your injury, what happened in like, say this car accident or this fall, it's not a single injury. It's, it's going to continue to progress. And so a lot of research is done on minimizing the progression of this injury. Uh, and in traumatic brain and spinal cord injury, we call this uh, secondary injury progression. So if we can neuroprotectively prevent this from happening, then we can maximize recovery. Now, what is a lot more attractive and people are interested in is this neuroregenerative approach. And this is where you're seeing, uh, like, let's say an entirely transected or spinal cord where there is complete severing. Um, and people will, you know, maybe modulate this issue with implantation or um, different therapeutic approaches in order to regenerate the spinal cord. Um, a lot of stem cell therapy is interested in something like this. This is a very complex issue that I would not deem myself a particular expert on. It is, um, it is a field within itself. Although I did focus more on the neuroprotective side, uh, but it translates to to nearly every uh, neurotrauma and neurodegeneration. So we can, let's say Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of people know of um, loved ones who suffer from these two, these two diseases that often lead to dementia. And if you have had someone in your life experience this, you know how important it is to try and identify it early on. There are a few more treatment options available earlier compared to, um, when when the disease has progressed or when it has advanced um 
Yeah, so it is unfortunate that once the injury has progressed considerably, um, whether it be, you know, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, these neurodegenerative diseases, it's really hard to reverse this damage. Um, and I think I think this is true for for most for most things that can be applicable. You know, it's much easier to I don't know if this is the best analogy. It's much easier to repair the battery of your car than to <laughs> repair a totaled car, you know, mm -hmm. um, and funny that you said battery, because that's almost what I would analogize mitochondria to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is that is an overlapping theme among all of these diseases is neurodegenerative disease, traumatic injuries. They are all going to result in mitochondrial dysfunction. And these mitochondria are so important and they're you know, I had, I had this professor in grad school. He was this German guy. I cannot impersonate him. I am um, very bad at impersonations, but <clears throat> he said mitochondria are so much more than their ATP synthase, which means like they're so much more than the powerhouse of the cell. They are the balance between life and death. And although that might be a, a rather dramatic approach and he was very theatrical, uh, there is a lot of truth into that. Um, mitochondria being able to maintain their function is important for cellular survival. So when your mitochondria become dysfunctional, your cells become dysfunctional and it can induce mechanisms um, to promote cell death. And like I said earlier, when your cells begin to die, particularly your neurons, it's so much harder to regenerate these and make them functional compared to other cell types. Um, so yeah, across all pathologies, uh, all, of, all of these diseases I've discussed, you have mitochondrial dysfunction, um, maybe not all for the same reasons, you know, uh, traumatic events can, through different pathways and mechanisms, induce mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, there can be ischemia or lack of blood flow, which will induce mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, the natural aging process shows that you begin to develop dysfunctional mitochondria. Um, so yeah, and that, and that is one of the reasons why people are so interested in this organelle is because it is so essential and it is consistently um, losing function. Um, mm -hmm. And so people target it as a therapy. Okay, so I have several questions. <laughs> um, there's just so many interesting avenues to go down. One question is you mentioned that in things like Alzheimer's, um, there is mitochondrial dysfunction. And I'm wondering like the chicken or the egg there, is it like the cells start failing and then the mitochondria start failing or vice versa, like mitochondrial dysfunction could be an underlying cause of some of these disorders. Absolutely. And I think that's something that has not been entirely elucidated yet. Um, yeah. And, and, and this is true for pretty much all neurodegenerative diseases, you know, like people are very, very hung up on, um, uh, oh, oh no, oh no, what the, uh, the aggregate clustering within, um, within Alzheimer's. Oh, uh, beta amyloid plaques and... Yeah, yeah, amyloid plaques, Lewy body formation for, for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. And again, chicken or the egg is is the dysfunction dementia happening because, you know, this is presenting itself um, or is it because is mitochondrial dysfunction leading to, to something like this? We do know that in early even early on cases where you're not symptomatic, but you might be showing um, like a phenotype in, within the brain that there is mitochondrial dysfunction. So whether it happens, whether it's causing your dementia, uncertain, but we know we can document it happening early on. That's so interesting. I never thought about that. You know, I've thought about like what you're saying, how there's every science as a whole, neuroscience knows that in Alzheimer's disease, you very often, actually always, I think, see these plaque buildups, but we know that if we remove the plaques, it doesn't necessarily remove the cognitive symptoms. I never thought about the mitochondrial dysfunction in that way too. It's like, it's, it's present a lot of the time or maybe all the time, but we don't know if it's the cause or if what happened. Alzheimer's is just sort of a big <laughs> confusing. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> yeah it, is. Um, it is. It is. It's a complicated disease. Um, yeah. Unfortunately so, affecting a lot of people. Uh, absolutely. So my other question earlier was with these neuroprotective approaches. So you're talking about the intervention right after a injury. And maybe this is more of like a fad question, but what if someone were to take these neuroprotective agents just like all the time? And then if they had an injury per se, maybe they would 
would it be protective in that sense or would it just be overall protective? Like what's the, what does the field say on that? Yeah. Like a prophylactic approach. Yeah. So there are a lot of studies. I would say the majority of studies done in spinal cord injury, um, treatment begins, uh, and let's say, let's, for the sake of this, say rodent studies, treatment, be uh, all rodent studies, because we're not testing uh, experimental spinal cord injuries on humans, right? <laughs> um, the majority of studies will begin at the time of injury, if not prior to. And so it is a prophylactic approach. And that has the best odds of success as far as retaining uh, function after injury. However, it excludes a large demographic of people who have already suffered from the injury. So how like clinically applicable, um, this, this is like a big question we have in research. And I think a lot of people have been like really challenging researchers to make sure that their studies are applicable to, you know, a clinical population eventually, at least no matter where um, you're at in the, in the research progression. Uh, the work I did, we would start treatment eight hours after injury. And this time point is probably the most feasible if you expect someone to make it to a clinical trial. It's, it's very, it's not realistic to expect people to make it within, within a four hour time point. So four to eight hours is a window where, you know, if your treatment works, if you can prove preclinically that it could be effective, then, then, then maybe it will also be effective in the, in the clinical population. Um, and yeah, the reason, the reason being is kind of what, what we were talking about earlier. It's so important to stop these injuries from worsening uh, early on. Mm -hmm. um, there is work, and, and, and what's also unfortunate is that there are studies done that show fabulous recovery at an early time point, like really remarkable, remarkable recovery after injury. And they'll take that same, and they'll deliver this treatment, let's say one hour after injury. And then in the next study, they'll wait 24 hours after injury and we'll see nothing no recovery of function. So that just goes to show how much damage can happen within that 24 hour window or even eight hour window. Um, yeah. So yeah. now I'm wondering when these clinical trials are done in human beings, uh, I assume you experience an injury, you go to the hospital and the hospital would alert like the nearest available clinical trial you know, and say, this is a treatment that's being, that's available right now. Would you like to try it? Um, I would think that if I were put, were put in that situation, I would say, give me whatever works. Like I, I need whatever can help the most. So are there like frontline tried and true treatments for spinal cord injury that are like automatically given? And if yeah. so, are the experimental treatments like added on top of it or how do they do that? Yeah. So spinal cord injury is probably one of the unique, most unique in terms of traumatic central nervous system injuries in that there is currently no standard of care. Um, so uh, I don't want to get the dates wrong, but late 90s, early 2000s, methylprednisolone, which is a glucocortico, it's, it's a steroid. Um, people, and, and it kind of impairs your inflammatory system. Um, and most people suffering from spinal cord injury or who are coming to the, to the emergency, emergency room immediately after were being treated with this anti-inflammatory compound. And in, several years ago, they removed that as the standard of care because it was actually providing, um, it, was, it was making outcomes worse. Um, there were incidents of um, sepsis as well as uh, even um, um, reduced, reduced, uh, capability. So reduced motor function after, after treating with methylprednisolone and the standard has not been replaced. So currently, and I went to a, I went to a conference a couple of years ago where I was, um, listening to some clinical physicians. So MD PhDs, um, talk about specific cases in their practice. And we're looking at these spinal cord injuries and discussing, you know, what treatment would you offer? And in so many cases, no surgical intervention, no pharmaceutical, purely treating symptoms, mitigating pain, treating symptoms, ensuring that breathing is intact. Um, so it was really unfortunate. And so, so in, in this, you know, hypothetical, you go, you go to the emergency room, you have a spinal cord injury, what do you ask for? There's very little you can ask for, you know, in 2020, um, 
for neuroprotection or for neuroregeneration, you know, there are there are therapies you can use to mitigate symptoms of, but as far as maintaining or ensuring intact uh, spinal function, that that is uh, not an option. So, wow. so yes, there are there. Are, I I would probably sim- be similar too, and that if there was a clinical trial, I'd be very eager to <laughs> to enter one. Um, yeah, and yeah. now everyone, you know. Of course, we don't want this happening to anyone, but if they're ever put in the situation, the earlier the treatment begins, probably the better. Um, yeah, absolutely. Especially for other for other diseases, for, for stroke, especially stroke is such a treat it as fast as possible. Early intervention, there are really, really good outcomes. Physicians have you know done really well in mitigating those issues um, or the, the symptoms if it can be addressed early on. Um, yeah, and then and, and for other neurodegenerative diseases too, there are a lot more options if you're able to identify it early. And I think that speaks to, and we, we won't get too much into this. I know we're focusing on the science, but accessibility of healthcare. I'm going to go on this real quick. Because <laughs> um, it's so important that you have one faith, faith in the healthcare system as well as, you know, it being accessible to you. Um, are you able to attend or go um and get annual checkups? Do you have a relationship with a physician that can ensure that, um, you know, across time they're monitoring monitoring your cognitive function, your motor capabilities to catch Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, multiple sclerosis early on? Um, Do you have the financial stability to get checked for stroke if you feel like you're experiencing symptoms before it becomes life-threatening? Stroke is always life-threatening, but um, or like, let's say a concussion, you know, a mild traumatic brain injury. Do you have the resources to get checked out early on? Um, I know that speaks to a broader issue. <laughs> we'll get we'll get back into a little bit of the, the nitty gritty on the science of it. But it is it is really important. I think it's something we need to we need to evaluate. Yeah, absolutely. I 100 percent agree um, yeah. with regard to the. So you described that there's no standard of care, um, but what is what type of treatments are being explored clinically? Like what are the clinical trials that are being done? Are they, are they all a neuroprotective side or any of them on the neuroregenerative side or what's like the most common? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, my focus is in um, addressing mitochondrial issues within the spinal cord. And so compounds that I'm familiar with that I um, will happily share um, are, are addressing this front. And so I will, I'll just focus on that without disclosing other clinical trial drugs, but um, there are several drugs that could be repurposed. Um, so you have, you have drugs that have been shown at least, not all in clinical trials, but have been shown to enhance mitochondrial function after injuries, uh, metformin, uh, resveratrol, and I always say this one wrong. Um, um, I'm just going to say those. I, mean, I have I have my little list here, but I'm going to say yeah. those two. Um, that that can I know metform, uh, metformin was in clinical trials for stroke. I don't know where it's at today, um, but it's been shown to induce mitochondrial biogenesis. That not might not be the leading mechanism um, that's being investigated, but it is something. Uh, another compound that's interesting that can induce you know heightened mitochondrial function and recovery after certain central nervous system injuries is melatonin uh, has been investigated preclinically as well as mitochondrial transplantation. Um, so there, there are a few drugs in preclinical and clinical trials being about several preclinical, but and also in clinical trials being evaluated. Interesting. Okay. So there, let's talk about mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, yeah. And I'm going to pull up this cool image, but feel free. There are a few images here that you can use if you'd like to that are from your slides. Um, yeah, yeah, I am. Yeah, let me. I, I'm happy to talk about th- this therapy. You know, so I've I've talked about you know overlapping um, damage across several different CNS injuries. I've talked about you know how mitochondrial dysfunction occurs after these injuries a little bit. Um, but yeah, let's discuss the therapy and what people are actually doing and, and why why mitochondria are such a hot topic. Um, so like I said, mitochondria, when they become dysfunctional, not only are you having decreased energy production, but you're also um, you're lowering your ability to buffer oxidants. So you have decreased antioxidant defense. Um, 
And you're also triggering mechanisms that can promote cell death, such as apoptosis. So a lot of researchers are trying to combat this issue by inducing what's called mitochondrial biogenesis, uh, which is a complex process that involves generating new and higher functioning mitochondria. Um, and it's a dynamic process as well. So how do I say? So can I let's say yes. really quick? Yeah. You, you said I'm, I'm already intrigued and maybe, I don't know, maybe this is the scientist in me that I'm like, let's go mitochondrial biogenesis. This is so cool. But when you said new and better functioning, can you identify and distinguish between new mitochondria uh, in a cell and have people like compared the function of those mitochondria and like, why would they be better than the original ones? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point. I should. Okay. So, um, Mitochondria are actually not created, created de novo. So they are, they don't just become produced as like a, like some protein might be translated. Um, they sp sprout essentially from pre-existing mitochondria. Um, so a higher functioning mitochondria is generally larger in size and has a higher um, oxygen consumption rate. Um, so if you're thinking about aerobic respiration, how that generates energy, a lot of people will measure mitochondrial function based on the amount of oxygen they're producing. And this is with um, several different uh, cellular assays that can be performed. Um, so here, here's an example of some of the research I did back in grad school. Uh, the left figure is a cross section of a spinal cord. So imagine, like, you know, you have your spinal cord column here and it's just cut this way and we're looking down at it. We can see, uh, can you see my, can you see my arrow or am I just? No, I can't. Okay, that's okay. Um, so right below that A panel, you see, you see these like uh, oval shapes and the, the filament around that is the myelin sheath actually. And then inside is the axon. And this is an electron microscopy image. So within this one axon, we're seeing very little mitochondria. Now on the right side, this is a spinal cord that's been treated uh, with a compound to induce mitochondrial biogenesis. So we're seeing more mitochondria with this being an enhanced image. We're seeing more mitochondria and the mitochondria are actually larger. Uh, and you can see that they take on very different shapes. So some might be small, some might be elongating. Um, and that, that could mean that they are budding off to form additional mitochondria. Um, but yeah, and so when you produce these mitochondria and they are, um, you know, you have a higher density and higher functioning, you're producing more energy, you're st stabilizing cellular systems to prevent um, cell demise, such as apoptosis. And then you're also buffering um, oxidant or um, you're enhancing antioxidant defense. And that last point is important because after injury, there is a huge wave of what's called uh, ROS, so radical oxygen species. And these, these little compounds saturate an injured area and they can damage tissue and lead to more cell death and demise. So, so th these are reasons why enhancing mitochondrial function can be really beneficial after injury. So I'm, I just want to go back to this picture for a second. I'm asking like these really basic questions that I'm actually genuinely curious about. Um, and they sound really silly coming out, <laughs> but what a, a, one mitochondria sprouts off of another, can it grow? Like what feeds a mitochondria or like, do you have to start with a big old mitochondria and then like smaller ones break off? Yeah, so mitochondria, uh, uh, what, what you're asking is, what do mitochondrial dynamics look like? Because uh, they are very, they're, they're not static entities, they are very dynamic. They um, can shift in shape, they can elongate, shrink, um, and there are a lot of different regulators to control mitochondrial dynamics. Not all of them are entirely teased out, um, and this, this is... I'm like thinking of very specific proteins that I don't think I, I would do do justice to, to get into at the moment. But um, there are regulators to control uh, mitochondrial dynamics, uh, one of which being 
the master regulator of what is known as mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, so this is a particular transcription factor. We don't have to get into to the nitty gritty, but there are, your, your body has in place certain proteins and certain regulators to control these functions. And that's actually an interesting point because these like very specific proteins are what we're evaluating to determine if we've induced mitochondrial biogenesis. So here is a very nice image where you see more mitochondria. Here is a very good representation, but when scientists are actually performing these studies, we don't always get these representative images. We have to rely on bar graphs and you know RNA analysis. Um, and when we rely on these RNA analyses or looking at specific proteins and concentration levels, in order to feel confident in making a conclusion, we look at regulators of um, these cellular pathways. So it's not just, do we see more mitochondria, but do we also see all the accompanying signals that we would expect to see? Absolutely, because you can still have mitochondria that are dysfunctional. Mm, interesting. And, and this, is, this is a big point with research. And whenever you're analyzing a, a publication, you know, just because they have one endpoint, endpoint being for this more mitochondria, it does not mean <laughs> that it's going to cure spinal cord injury. Just because, um, and this is, uh, you know, let's say let's say for neurodegenerative disease, just because it has reduced brain volume, um, or you've you've maintained brain volume, or if you've you've been able to mitigate some detrimental issue, does not mean that cognition is better. It does not mean that they walk better, think better, talk better. Uh, so scientists have to do multiple tests, and this is what you'll see when you look at research publications um, and like the vigor that researchers take to be confident that not only are you seeing significance within like a specific point, but you're you're seeing an impact. Like this might actually make it to the clinic one day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like that's a really great point. It, those are the, th that's what distinguishes um, like really high level, high impact mm -hmm. research from l lower impact research is like all the papers you see in these top journals, nature, science, whatever, they, if they make a single claim, there's like 10 supplemental figures where they're showing it in all different ways. And just like this, like not only were there more mitochondria, but we also found that the master regulator gene was also overexpressed, suggesting that it's you know, another endpoint confirming our, our suspicion. Um, so. Yeah, absolutely. You have to be able to back it up. Um, and I think this is, you know, there's talk of the, like the preclinical to clinical gap, this, th there's a like nice little schematic and term for it that, that they um, don't have <laughs> ready to pull up. Uh, but it's, it's this like valley of death is what people call it. You know, you have such good preclinical research and all of these like papers are so exciting and we can cure this, 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 and then you take it to the clinic and nothing works. And it's because we're not being, so many researchers are not being vigorous enough to make sure that they're looking at more than one endpoint and, and to make sure that the endpoints they're looking at are clinically applicable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this case, your goal is to not only increase the, I don't know what will be the term, the number the density of mitochondria, um, but the function. And so this actually as a whole, this is mitochondrial biogenesis. You are inducing mitochondrial biogenesis with a drug in this case, I would assume. Yes. Yes. Right. Um, so if, did you have any other indications that this was effective? Like how, if, yeah, did the mice, yeah, so like, I guess is what absolutely. I so the endpoints, as far as mitochondrial biogenesis, we looked at mitochondrial density. Uh, we looked at, um, you know, certain proteins that demonstrate function. We looked at the actual oxygen consumption. So like the most functional aspect of the mitochondria, we have out evaluated um, cellular stability, all to say that mitochondrial biogenesis has been induced. And then to say that this induction promotes recovery from spinal cord injury, we evaluate we evaluate um, the spinal cord's pathology. So, you know, after a spinal cord injury, you'll have a lesion or all this damaged tissue. And we evaluate this and say, oh, the injury is smaller now. There is a decreased lesion. And this is some of the research I did with the far left column being a spinal cord, three sections down um, of an intact animal, no damage. The middle is a spinal cord that was damaged with no treatment. And on the right side is a spinal cord damaged with treatment 
uh, and this blue staining stains myelin, uh, which can help be representative of, you know, the integrity of your spinal cord. And we see from the middle column at the most injured site, there is very little blue staining. So very little myelin present in this injury. However, we see some recovery of this myelination with treatment on the right side. So this is another endpoint. Um, but this, the, even this alone isn't enough. Saying that the lesion is smaller, uh, whether it's brain injury, spinal cord injury, another pathology isn't enough. We also evaluate locomotor function. So are these you know, are these subjects walking better? Uh, and that is that is the most important. You know, you can have, and that's what people want to see. You can have all of this recovery. I could make the spinal cord look perfect again, <laughs> but if if the subjects aren't walking better, then then what is what is my therapy actually doing? You know, um, yeah. So that that's that is like the the like pinnacle endpoint is is their functional recovery, right? Yeah. And it's like, if you can make them walk perfectly without touching the spinal cord, then great. But that's just impossible because that's not how the spinal cord works. Um, yeah. But, okay. So I back up question that just hit me. You've referred to mitochondrial biogenesis as a neuroprotective treatment, right? So Correct. to me, it would seem more of like a neuroregenerative treatment because it's, it is sort of like restoring some function, right? Is it like, would you put it somewhere in between? Um, I think it's a little bit challenging, um, you know, because the, these terms are not definitive, neuroprotective versus regenerative. Um, and, and it depends on what you're looking at, right? Are you regenerating the neurons? So we've shown like axons can be regenerative. Um, they are, they can be quite plastic compared, compared to the actual cell body. Um, myelination can be regenerative if the oligodendrocyte isn't damaged. So to the capacity of regeneration that we're discussing, um, it, it could, it could also be deemed like kind of middle ground. Um, mm -hmm. But like, I would say it's like most formative role is, is protective. Um, so yeah. Les Miditan, mm -hmm. I'm not pronouncing that right, um, is an agent that in induces mitochondrial biogenesis. Yeah, so lasminidin is actually really interesting, and something that we studied a lot in my previous, uh, my my grad grad school lab, was taking drugs that are in clinical trials or FDA approved for a different disease and repurpose repurposing them. Um, so lasminidin was FDA approved in 2019. Its uh, clinical or trademark name is Ravao uh, for the treatment of migraines. Hmm. Uh, it is a um, it's, uh, it hits one of the 14 serotonin receptors. It is not an SSRI. It does not hit the SSRI, um, like the, the serotonin 2A receptor. It does not treat depression. Um, but it was, it was recently approved for the treatment of migraines. And the reason why this can be so efficient um, or so, so um, a good opportunity is because FDA approval is a very long, very expensive process. So if you don't have to develop a new drug, if you don't have to go through all of the toxicity um, testings um, or pharmacodynamic kinetic testings, then it expedites the process of getting it approved for a different disease. Um, so that, that was the drug I studied uh, was lasmididan. Okay, so you don't have to answer this because it might be a lot, but... How does lesmitidin induce mitochondrial biogenesis? Yeah, absolutely. So it hits a receptor. It's called the um, 5-hydroxy tryptamine 1F receptor uh, or 5-HT1F serotonin 1F receptor. And when it binds to this receptor, it induces a pathway that eventually hits the master regulator of mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, PGC1 alpha, if you remember, if anyone remembers that. Um, and when you hit this master regulator, you stimulate all of these mechanisms to promote mitochondrial function. And when you promote this mitochondrial function, it will stabilize your, you know, the, the, the neuron, the, the several different cell types. Um, with my research, I showed that it also improved the vasculature. So after injury, there's a lot of compromised vasculature. And I would say, outside of the immediate damage, restoring vasculature, um, 
is one of the, if not the most important thing to do. Uh, when you have these leaky vessels, you are having neurotoxins just saturate your, your tissue, your central nervous system. And that is just uncontrolled inflama in, um, inflammation, neurotoxins, excitotoxicity. Um, so if you can restore the vasculature as quickly as possible, you're going to maintain um, some, some cellular stability. So mm -hmm. this drug uh, helped reestablish the vasculature as well as um, some of the endpoints I talked about, um, remyelination of the injured area um, and improved locomotor capability. Wow. This may be like really silly to say, but for some reason I find it amazing that a serotonin receptor can then trigger downstream signaling cascades, which elicit change, like transcriptional changes inside of the mitochondria with its own genome. I don't know why that like blows my mind. Is, should that not be blowing my mind? <laughs> no, it is. It is interesting. Um, like how, how something so broad, you know, just like a receptor that has a lot of other functions can ultimately hit such a very specific pathway um, with mitochondria being so unique. So actually, not only does do mitochondria have their own genome, which you just alluded to, but they have their own transcription factors in order to to promote um, to promote the development of more mitochondria um, as well as regulate function, uh, and so. So that master regulator I said of mitochondrial biogenesis, PGC1 alpha, it moves into, it, it indirectly ends up hitting that mitochondrial genome in order to stimulate, stimulate production. Um, I just saw Kelsey asked a question. Did you look at the BBB at all or only in the spinal cord? So the BBB is the blood brain barrier. And for neuroscientists, um, a lot of us know that this is the barrier that prevents your blood from entering the brain. Uh, and it's really important in the vasculature in your brain and spinal cord are uh, more unique than uh, your other organs. Um, like I said earlier, there's, there's a potential for inflammation and neurotoxins to enter your brain from your blood. So we have this added barrier in our bodies. Um, and yes, <laughs> I did evaluate the blood spinal cord barrier within this and I saw enhanced recovery. We actually, I, I didn't think anyone would ask, so I deleted that slide, Kelsey. Mm -hmm. um, but, but yes, so stimulating recovery of this blood spinal cord barrier, BSCB or blood brain barrier, BBB, um, and, and actually all disorders is really important. Yeah, so here, here is an example of um, a, a cross section of the blood brain barrier. So you have endothelial cells, which are like the standard cell type of your vasculature, um, as well as many other cell types. Um, and on the right, you see you have, th this is protein expression of occludin and clodin five. So tight junctions that kind of like are the integrity of this barrier. Um, and yes, treatment ended up restoring, restoring these, restoring the barrier um, or enhancing recovery. I, I don't want to say restore. We didn't cure the barrier, you know, but was recovery was enhanced. Um, so there's another question. How did they discover this specific pathway? What made them narrow down to this specific drug? I think that, you know, like, like I was asking about this 1F receptor, it's like, how did that happen? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, so it, it is interesting. Uh, and it was kind of a reverse. So they did this like huge profile. And they like I said earlier, we looked at one of the endpoints is mitochondrial respiration, you know, how much oxygen are they taking in? So they did this study where they just like threw like a thousand, <laughs> a thousand different drugs onto mitochondria and see if any of them enhanced, enhanced them. Um, oxygen consumption and some of these drugs hit. Uh, and so then they started, you know, oh, well, what, what receptors do these drugs hit? You know, let's look at the crystal forms of the receptors. Let's see how they're interacting. And then, and then, oh, signaling, signaling is a beast in and of itself. <laughs> um, it's very complex to elucidate a single pathway. And I, I do want to state that just because a drug is hitting mitochondrial biogenesis does not mean it's not hitting other pathways. Um, 
it's very hard and, and for researchers to say this specific pathway is being altered and nothing else is happening. Mm-hmm. If you see a paper that says that, then in 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 vivo, you know, maybe maybe you can do that within cells, but it, it's it's challenging. Um, but yeah, so it is it is interesting to think that at some point researchers were able to you know, narrow in on such a specific pathway and identify this master regulator. I wish I knew uh, all of the history in it. I know a little bit. I know my previous advisor, um, Dr. Rick Schnellman, he's the dean at the uh, University of Arizona, um, did a lot of formative work uh, in in determining determining how we can induce mitochondrial biogenesis. Um, I also see that (laughs) this person asks, caffeine passes through the blood-brain barrier smoothly, which always fascinates me. And it is really interesting. The blood, so not only is the, so the barriers are actually different between the spinal cord and the brain, um, different permeability levels, um, but they are highly selective in order to allow certain molecules in while like protecting you from other from other substances. Um, yeah, highly, highly regulated, very complex. We don't, we know a lot. We are learning a lot more as researchers, but there's still a lot, um, to, to be learned about, about the barrier and its potential to induce recovery. Yeah. I, I find the BBB to be fascinating and I wish I knew more about it. Um, but I guess maybe there's a lot that we still need to figure out. (laughs) <laughs> but going back pretty much off topic, but I think it's, I think science history can be really, really interesting. And I wish that, um, more scientists would do this scientists. If you're watching after you finally retire, if it ever happens, write a book about like everything that happened in your field throughout your career and just like lay out the progression because that stuff is like really hard to find it. I don't want to sit down and read it a hundred years <laughs> of papers. I, you know, you were there. Just tell me what happened. <laughs> I yeah, I, I definitely feel that. I think sometimes what scientists have kind of been deprived from the last two years are, you know, interactions amongst each other um, or especially conferences, because you can have just a veteran scientist, you know, and they they will they they will let you know everything that they did. Like they spend maybe only 10 minutes talking about their current research just because they want you to appreciate like the 40 years of work and strife that they went through. And mm-hmm. I always really enjoy those because it, it is so insane how much information um, has been gained, like even within 10 years. And then you think 40 years, like how did you start research 40 years ago with like much cruder, you know, analyses and techniques that they did um yeah absolutely and the field's advancing so much more quickly now the new the new techniques Mm -hmm. we have the the speed of discovery is increasing intensely um so it is i want to ask like a really key question here mitochondrial biogenesis you've shown is effective for restoring um essentially like boosting spinal cord damage healing. Mm -hmm. So what is it about adding more mitochondria that enables the tissue to heal more effectively? Like what is the, what is the key here? Yeah. And I don't think that we have elucidated like a very specific answer, you know, Um, other than, you know, you are, the, the theory is that you are stabilizing the cells long enough <laughs> to not die so that they can mm-hmm. eventually function in, in a healthy environment. So kind of stabilize the cells, allow the body to heal itself while also promoting healing. So like kind of talking about the vasculature, like get those blood, <laughs> get those blood vessels back in order, um, maintain life of your neurons, <laughs> maintain mm-hmm. the oligodendrocytes, like maintain the capacity to remyelinate. And then once that occurs, you know, your body can naturally heal at, at a higher rate than what it would have. Um, Cause like I said, after spinal cord injury, not everyone is fully paralyzed. Even if you have a lower level spinal cord injury, like at the lumbar region, which is prevalent for a lot of falling, um, you're gonna have spinal shock. You know, your, your body is going to freeze. Your, that, like one, two, three days after injury is when you're going to be probably the most, um, you're gonna feel the effects the most. Um, and then your body will naturally begin to recover, recover. So what this mitochond, what I believe this mitochondrial biogenesis approach is, it is maximizing your body's ability to recover. Mm -hmm. 
And what's interesting is it's not just done with drugs. And I, we talked about this uh, a little bit beforehand, but exercise actually induces mitochondrial biogenesis and has been shown to be in, in clinical, in the clinic, to be really productive in terms of um, recovery after injury. You know, it's, it's not going to cure spinal cord injury, but it has a huge capacity to benefit, to benefit someone. And is the benefits of exercise on mitochondria, um, are those ubiquitous across the entire body and brain, or is that more specific to muscle cells? Yeah. So I'd say the most research has been done, uh, has been in terms of, you know, uh, within, within the muscle, within the skeletal muscle, um, specifically, but there are a lot of studies looking at it within the spinal cord and within the brain. Um, yeah, so it, it has the capacity to do both to what, what regard it does naturally within the within these um, CNS tissues within the absence of injury. Um, you know, it is, is being, you know, like, like that prophylactic tape, like if you exercise every day and then you get spinal cord injury, are you more likely to recover than someone who didn't exercise? I can't make that statement, <laughs> um, but but it, it can induce mitochondrial biogenesis. It's interesting. So I, I have a kind of like a whole analogy for all this I've been thinking of. So when you get like really, really sick and you go to the hospital, let's say, and they just like give you an IV and give you fluids and, you know, food, feed you and just sort of the whole goal is like just supporting your physiological life, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. giving you everything you need to, to stay alive, maybe putting you on a respirator if you need to. Um, that's sort of the equivalent, but like for a single cell in the spinal cord. So if there's like a yeah. damage, it's like the mitochondria are like the IV and the respirator. And <laughs> it's like keeping the cell just like, just hold on, don't die. And then <laughs> yeah. as if they do die, then there's scarring and damage too, which can exacerbate it. Right. Yeah. I, I actually never thought of that, but it, it is very similar for certain cell types. Like just, just hold on, um, you know, like let, let just survive while we address these other issues. Uh, it's kind of like triage. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and in a sense, it's almost like if you drink, like I drink four or five of these a day, I'll try to, and like maybe my body's more hydrated. So then if I were to go in the hospital, I wouldn't need as much fluids to keep me alive. Maybe just May, oh, as far as like the exercise. Right. So then it's like if you're exercising and your cells have more mitochondria, then maybe your cell, more, a greater proportion of your cells will survive the impact or the damage. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, I, it's, it's hard to tell. And a study like that would be really challenging because people who generally exercise consistently have like better, better like blood pressure, like physiologically are just like healthier. And so their ability to heal. And this, this is not just the theory. This is proven outside of spinal cord injury, I don't want to speak on that, but in general, your capacity to heal from an injury is much greater if you, if you have healthy physiology compared mm -hmm. to if you're already ill. Um, yeah, that is a really good point to make. I, I hadn't considered that those analogies. I like them. I will, I will be using them in the future. <laughs> right. Well, I'm glad you like them. I always like to think of every cell as a person. I don't know why <laughs> it's, I find it helpful because it's like, here, I'm going to go back to the conversation stage um yes. i just it's like we all have organs that all do different things and cells have organelles and like we are all like a one big cell <laughs> is this how we're wrapping it up we are all one <laughs> we're all one cell yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah it is it is, a, it is a community within itself it, it's interesting that like we have to like learn and i've seen this kind of on on the internet like Oh, like our body knows exactly what it's doing. Why can't it inform my mind so I don't have to study? Or like, why why am I having to like figure all this out if my body already knows what's going on? But it is its own community and its own like very regulated system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's now you got me doing a whole like spin in my head <laughs> thinking about like it is amazing though because there are these systems in your cells and in your organs. They all know know how to regulate themselves, right? Like these these are all built into biology and trying to yeah. reverse engineer that and figure out what's happening is so complex. Yeah. But on the same side, then all of a sudden your body, you know, starts to like a neurodegenerative disease or start, starts attacking itself. And it's like, I thought we, I thought we understood what we were doing here. Like, why, right. why is this happening? Where's the disconnect? Yeah. And so, yeah, it is. And it's a good approach to see it as a system. And I think a lot of, a lot of people, 
sometimes fail to do that. And researchers, myself included, have sometimes failed to see the bigger picture. You know, you get you you spend so much of your time focused on a very specific niche. Like for me, I was focused on this one protein. Like all I want to do is like research and understand this protein. It's you have to take a step back, you know, like don't get what is it? Don't you only see the trees, not the forest. There's a better way to describe that. But um, yeah, you can't get lost in it. You have to understand what you're looking at, how it's incorporated into the system. And then when you when you evaluate it on that front, you can see how many different ways therapies or, you know, certain pathways um, play roles with um, within each other. Mm -hmm. Now, one pathway does not have one role. Usually it's, it's very integrated. Um, the body... The cellular system is a web that no one has fully parsed and teased out, but we are trying. <laughs> yeah, and it's redundant. There are multiple mechanisms for controlling the same systems or the same functions and stuff. Um, but sometimes then there's not. Sometimes it's not redundant. And then like a, a damage to a single molecule is like terrible. Whereas right, right. because there's not enough backups pretty much. So, um, well, so overall, I want to know what is your view on like the future of this field do you think that there is hope that one of these compounds potentially in clinical trials or not yet discovered will soon be um or maybe down the road will be like a go-to treatment for this type of thing yeah i think there's been a lot of work done on the neuroprotective front and i i do believe that there will probably be a newly established standard of care within the next several years um if not sooner uh, there's been some really promising data What's more interesting is the work being done on the neuroregenerative front. Uh, and on even though it'll probably be several years till we see this, I think we will eventually have, you know, the capacity to have, and I don't want to get into Neuralink, that's not what I'm saying, <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the capacity to, you know, recover a lot of our functions, irregardless of a transected spinal cord, where there is an entire severance um, and no direct connection from the brain to the spinal cord. Um, wow. Yeah, I think that people who suffer from these diseases should should be optimistic. Um, I know we talked a lot about preventative and, you know, trying to find solutions early on, but there is a growing number of researchers invested in in serving the community of people that that aren't that aren't going in the hospital within four or eight hours, that aren't able to get into clinical trials, um, that are several years into a disease and want to, you know, regain autonomy, regain mobility. Um, yeah. And, and improve a standard of care. Yeah. And I think that that's such an, that's such a key point. You know, you think of someone experiences an injury, they're going to go to the hospital, they're going to get care. Um, but that's not the case for everyone. It's not, it's not accessible to everyone. And especially in a situation like this, where you've described how the timing is so key. Um, it's just, it's ever more important. It's so interesting how you never really think about that until like you lay it out that way. I had actually never thought about it that way before. So I think looking at those long-term um, delayed treatment approaches are going to be obviously extremely important. So extremely important, extremely expensive, extremely mm -hmm. expensive, but like that shouldn't be a deterrent for serving people who really need, need therapy yeah. and need options and opportunities. So Okay, so now I need to ask you another question because you got to talk about this. So in the field that I'm sort of working on with psychedelics, there's this idea that uh, like psilocybin, psychedelic mushrooms, induces neuroplasticity and sort of like allows your, allows for like a short-term period of cognitive flexibility where you can sort of like reshape your percepts of things and maybe address shame and trauma and things like that. Do you think... This is impossible to answer. I'm sorry. Do you think there's any no, possibility I, for something like that in the spinal cord where like you could temporarily like evoke a state of, I don't know if it would be even called plasticity, but just sort of like susceptibility to change and, and healing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are, so there's a lot of plasticity after injury um, beyond, beyond just like the damage. Um, axons are regrowing. They're probably more that's probably like one of their like most dynamic after other than like you know development and establishing your central nervous system so dynamic um in terms of growing sprouting and you're gonna have a lot of and this is this is an issue in the brain too um 
stem cell therapy, like even if they're even even if something is plastic, even if you're having these redevelopment of pathways, doesn't mean it's always functional. Um, this is issues with stem stem cell treatment. You know, just because you have more neurons does not mean they're integrated into the system. Plasticity is a little bit better because you're addressing like the, the connections rather than um, you know producing more cells. Uh, yeah, I think. I think it could definitely have a role and it might not honestly have more of a role later on rather than at an early time point. Um, yeah, it, it would be challenging. The, what I would be interested in, and this is me speaking pure, pure speculation. So I'm going to remove my PhD <laughs> from, from these, uh, from this like hypothetical. Um, if during like sensory motor training or when you're trying to reestablish a connection. So we know, we know that um, you're, just like muscles are, you know, muscle memory, the brain and the spinal cord act, react similarly, where if you have repetitive motions, you're going to reinforce this connection and it will be stronger. My like question in a theoretical experiment would be in the presence of like, you said a psychedelic essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Where you have enhanced plasticity, will this, be beneficial to more quickly or more strongly producing a, a connection that you're trying to establish uh, as a motor function. You know, a lot of people think of it as like cognitive dynamics, but mm -hmm. which That's, are just as physical, <laughs> but it's nice yeah. to see like a visual, like a, like your like connection to a muscle. Yeah. That is so interesting. I don't think that you should have removed your PhD for that comment. I'm going to refer <laughs> to the back into that comment. Okay. I think it's really cool. And I don't think the research is there at all to address whether psychedelics similarly evoke synaptic plasticity in the spinal cord uh, the same way they do in the, um, in the brain. But I mean, if serotonin receptors are expressed in the spinal cord, then perhaps they do. Perhaps. But, yeah. That's intriguing. Yeah, write a grant, write a grant and I'll, I'll do that. I'll do I'm, the I'm, I'm seeing a collaboration project emerge right now. <laughs> No. Really um, yeah, I feel like we both have enough work, but we can we can do <laughs> we can do another project. Yeah, if anyone here sure. watching wants to uh, help be an assistant in the lab, yeah. please we we need help. You've watched yeah, the project in the test subject. Let us know. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's that's really interesting though. Um, I I will be curious to see where that all goes and where the field leads. Now, because seriously, I don't. You have enlightened me a lot about this entire field. And I actually think mitochondria are super cool now. I, I knew that they were cool. They weren't the coolest. I'm happy to convince at least one more person that they are worthwhile to read about. Yeah, they're- Mission accomplished. Th they are super cool. And let's just close with one more question. Mm -hmm. The whole like mitochondria being a separate organism that was like absorbed by human cells. What's the deal with that? Can you clear things up? <laughs> Oh, because you've seen that in like some of the, the, yeah. So, oh wait, sorry. Say that mitochondria absorbed by. Being like taken in mitochondria originating as a separate microorganism that were taken in by human cells and function within human cells in like a symbiotic relationship. Oh, like the original establishment of them. Yeah. In human cells. Yeah. Or animal yeah, cells. Yeah. 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 You know, um, I am, I am not the one, <laughs> I'm not the one with those evolutionary answers. That's I, right. <laughs> I, yeah, but it is, it is. And it, and you also, you, um, get your mitochondria on the maternal, maternal, um, side. So you do not have your father's mitochondria. Do we know why that is? Um, yes. Science itself. <laughs> researchers are, are aware of why that is. Um, at one point in my life, I was also aware of, <laughs> of why that was. Uh, um, I can really, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm really curious because to promote this episode, I did a video on three fun facts, which I got from your paper. And yeah. um, those were the two most common comments I got. People were said, you should have done that they're maternally inherited and that they started off as a microorganism. And I was like, I don't know if I even, I don't know if I want to talk about those. I'm not so sure. <laughs> Like I, I, yeah, no, it is. It is. I actually, I think I learned that in, in high school, maybe. Um, yeah. I remember learning about like the existence of that fact, but not like the rationale or explanation. Yeah. And it's part of the reason why mitochondria have their own genome is because it's theorized that they were, they were their own entity prior yeah. to um, 
yeah, it's interesting how that can happen. And then they're just so integral in every biological system. Um, yeah, I mean, I wonder if there's any way or if any scientists have like proven that like if you remove mitochondria and just put them in a dish that they just survive or like do they exist naturally in the wild yeah uh oh i don't know about in the wild but i have i have done experiments with isolated mitochondria um yeah i wasn't i wasn't seeking long-term viability i was just doing like a quick experiment but they, they can be isolated and maintain function for Whoa. a respective amount of time can and you can like culture them i would assume um so these were not cultured these okay. were not yeah these are just like extracted for an experiment or something. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I wonder, cause like I'm thinking about how they like split. What's the word? Is there a word for that? How they. Yeah. Uh, uh, fission. F yes. So the, the, the dynamics of mitochondria is uh, mitochondrial fusion and fission. Yeah. So it makes me wonder, like you could sort of culture them in a way, like they might continue to split. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe, you know, this is also, again, I, I am sure that there is some data research studies on this, but, um, but, but yeah, maybe at one point in time prior to integration, they were able to regulate currently they need cellular, they, they need external mm -hmm. regulation. So that master regulator PGC one alpha, that is, um, that is intracellular. That is not an entity of the mitochondria. Mm. It's regulation. And they are also regulated within the cellular genome, not specifically within the mitochondrial genome. So interesting. So, so as they stand now, <laughs> I don't know if they, they could persist on their own for a yeah. oh, that's interesting. long amount of time. Well, I appreciate you enlightening me about all these cool facts about mitochondria. Um, I've really enjoyed this. This has been a really good conversation. I have learned a lot and I appreciate yeah you not only joining me, but also having slides and showing some of that great stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was nice sharing uh, the information. Yeah. And for anyone who's interested, again, Dr. Piff, I'm going to put it on the chat again, but she is officially, oh, it worked that time, uh, on TikTok and Instagram. Yeah. Right? I don't know yes. about Twitter, but TikTok and Instagram, check her out and, uh, you will love what you find. So <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. you. I so appreciate you for having me. Of course. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming. And uh, if we could get a round of applause in the in the chat, I know there's there it is. Yes, it's just so oh, it's so sweet. Oh, <laughs> so you, much man. support. I appreciate you all. Okay, thank you everybody. Appreciate it, and thank you, Do thank you, Dr. Piff. I'm not gonna stop calling you that now. <laughs> okay. Have a good.